The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Overcoming the Challenges of Diverse Tenosynovial Giant Cell Tumor Presentations, Diagnostic and Treatment Principles for the Multidisciplinary Team. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash AEC 860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Hello, and welcome to Overcoming the Challenges of Diverse TGCT Presentations, Diagnostic and Treatment Principles for the Multidisciplinary Team. I am Dr. Andrew Wagner from the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston, and I'm very pleased to welcome my colleague, Dr. Nicholas Bernthal from the David Geffen School of Medicine at the University of California, Los Angeles. Uh, today, we're going to use contrasting case presentations to explore how the multidisciplinary team, uh, including orthopedic surgeons and oncologists, can collaborate when managing tenosynovial giant cell tumor, or TGCT. One focus of our discussion will be the challenges of diffuse TGCT presentations and how they require multidisciplinary care. During this program, we will periodically share several resources for TGCT management You'll want to refer to these practice aids throughout our discussion, so please take a moment to download these practical tools before we get started. Nick, it's good to see you. I think we'll start with a, a case, um, and maybe you want to present this, this patient and the management? Yeah, thanks. Great, great to see you, um, and looking forward to talking about some of these challenging TGCT cases. Um, so uh, let's start with this, what we'll call case one, and this person we will call Chris. Um, and uh, he's a young guy who shows up um, to an orthopedic surgeon uh, with a presentation of classic TGCT. There's an effusion in the knee and uh, he's had uh, intermittent pain and swelling. Um, on MRI, uh, he has um, this uh, diffuse TGCT. You can see several nodules in the knee in that uh, effusion anteriorly especially. Um, but, but I don't think either of us would look at this and, and say that this is the most dramatic presentation. Um, he saw a uh, sports medicine surgeon who decided to go ahead and proceed with arthroscopy in 2019. And um, if we go to the next slide, you'll see he, uh, he then um, has an arthroscopic procedure and just six months later, he uh, presents, he represents with increased effusion, gets a new MRI, and you see in fact that his tumor burden is more dramatic post-operatively than it was pre-operatively. Um, and you know, I, I think this is one of these cases that highlights the reality that most TGCT is taken care of it not at tertiary sarcoma centers, but by sports medicine physicians or other orthopedic surgeons. Um, and so this patient came to see me with this recurrence. And what was really interesting is that his fundamental frustration was really around the idea that he had no information about TGCT going in. He thought he was coming to see me to discuss a repeat surgery that, that the surgery didn't go well in quotes and, and the tumor is back, it means that they didn't get it out. And so he presents with this and, and um, this recurrence and, and increasing pain and there was a deep, deep frustration with the outside surgeon because none of the sort of different options for treating TGCT were discussed. This was discussed as a, as a sort of slam dunk 30 minute arthroscopy that was going to cure him. And here he was six minutes, uh, excuse me, six months later with increased pain and increased tumor. So at this point, we discussed some of the systemic options, introduced him to medical oncology. We talked about open synovectomy. We talked about systemic therapies. And, and you know, he really wanted to think about this. And, and you can see then if you advance uh, one more slide, you see he, he returns another six to nine months later and you just see the massive proliferation of the TGCT. And so, you know, I, I, I think talking about a case like that, and in fact, if you look at that first cut on the left, the sagittal cut, you see now he's getting those true bone erosions. You see on the tibial side of the knee joint, he, he has a true bone erosion there in, in, in a young, young person. Um, so this, this um, I think, really highlights some of the, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. 
um, uh, uh, about kind of how we introduce patients to the landscape? Yeah, I think this is a very classic presentation. And, and we see a biased subset of patients, those who do have recurrent disease. There certainly are some, which I think we'll talk about, in which that initial arthroscopy can cure their disease, but there's other um, subsets of the disease, which is really notorious for recurrence. Uh, and some patients it stays asymptomatic, but in others it has this more um, vigorous growth pattern uh, with increasing symptoms. Uh, and I think it becomes a struggle to figure out how best to manage it. Uh, I think clearly the, the role that, that you mentioned of multidisciplinary um, teamwork on this is, is quite important. Uh, there's the surgical aspects, and as we'll talk about a little bit later, there are the medical aspects of, of care here too. Um, so I think, as you described, that initial management is, was, was fine. It's just that there, there is a risk of recurrence in some subsets of this disease that, that needs further attention. Yeah, and, and I think as a field, um, we have to figure out when to you know, educate and introduce. And I, I think we have this bias at these multidisciplinary tumor boards and tertiary centers that, that we don't see a barrier to additional referrals and discussions. And um, you know, I think the, the reality is, is that that can be seen as, wait a minute, you're referring me to medical oncology. What does that mean? I thought you said this was benign. Um, but, but really, you know, even a patient with this same pathway uh, perhaps would have had a much better experience um, had he been introduced to the landscape before that initial arthroscopy. And what we're doing at our place is really trying to make sure that everyone gets introduced to the disease, the high recurrence rate if it's a diffuse type disease up front and even if they choose to go through with arthroscopy, which is a reasonable path, um, they're sort of prepped for, for the natural history of this and the possibility that this could be the camp they're in. Um, and, and I do feel like we lost six to nine months on the back end because introducing him to the landscape with a diffuse recurrence, he had sort of lost trust in the system already. Um, yeah. So, so, you know, maybe that's a, a segue into just a little bit of background on TGCT. Um, there are two different types. There's the localized type and the diffuse type. And, and you see on this slide, they're dramatically different on imaging. Um, they can often present similarly in terms of symptoms because the effusion that's caused, uh, you know, localized type can cause a real effusion. But in essence, even though these are um, similar mesenchymal neoplasms under the microscope, um, the involvement of the synovium, whereas it's a single nodule that can be easily removed in localized type versus this diffuse destructive tumor on, on the diffuse type um, uh, really, really present different paradigms. If, if we look at diffuse type TGCT, which by and large is I think gonna be the focus of what we talk about today, um, that diffuse type TGCT is, is really ill-defined. If you look at this sagittal MRI on the right, it's hard to see where tumor ends and normal begins. There's a lot of edema in the surrounding tissues. There's bone destruction in this case, not always, but often. Um, and, and I think, you know, surgeons have learned humility in this disease um, because it, it, is, um, it is frustrating for the surgeons and the patients. Tumor is hiding in every nook and cranny of this. Um, recurrence rates um, are published at above 50% by and large. I think most of us who follow this closely with MRIs believe that that's an optimistic view of the world. Um, and, and the symptoms are significant. Um, and when you talk about high recurrence rate in a disease that often by and large is of young people, this is something that, that you know, we're, we're taking on these patients for life. Yeah, and just to add a little bit is the, the symptoms that, that that patients present with are, are as, as are listed here on this slide. But I think what's also really important is to ask patients about how their affected joint might be uh, causing limitations in the activities they want to perform. So sometimes they may not fit into a perfect basket of, of what their symptoms are, but they might say, I don't feel stable when I'm skiing, or uh, I have pain when I'm biking, or things like that, which they say, I just stopped doing those activities because, because I don't feel well with that. Um, so it's a, it's a quite wide variety of presentations, which also makes the assessments more difficult for research studies because it doesn't fit neatly into one bucket of, of, of measurement. 
Great, great points. Um, so, you know, diagnostically, um, MRI is the mainstay. Um, you know, we often see, we look at radiographs as standard orthopedic practice, and because this often causes a persistent inflammation that can cause joint erosions, you can see that on uh, plain x-rays. Um, but, but really, MRI shows the tumor, shows the location of the tumor, um, and, and shows the involvement both intra-articular and extra-articular. Uh, we do use CTs periodically when, when MRI is not an option. Um, and, and as discussed before, I mean, I, I do think that, that surgery remains the standard of care. Um, there's a lot of debate of the how. There's technical and, and you know, everybody believes their way is the right way. But in the, in the end, um, I think we all agree that, that the diffuse type recurrence rates are, are extremely high. Um, I think one of the key things, though, is we all teach each other about this disease because we're all so biased in what patients come in to, to where we sit on this kind of paradigm in terms of severity is that, you know, we talk a lot about this high recurrence rate, but it's, it's equally important to recognize the localized type or the diffuse type that has a really high chance of cure with surgery. And so this sort of multidisciplinary view of, of trying to pick out where the right person gets to the right treatment paradigm becomes, uh, becomes essential. Nick, how do you, can I ask yeah. you, how do you choose between whether a patient needs surgery or can be observed? Yeah, I think that's, that's a great question and, and an evolving question. Um, I've become uh, uh, much more conservative in, in jumping in surgically. I think one of the things we've learned um, and to maybe extrapolate from our desmoid uh, experience is you know, in a disease where surgery has a high recurrence rate, um, a little bit of patience and understanding the natural history of that patient's tumor um, becomes really important. Um, we do see people, as I'm sure, I'm sure you do as well, that the disease is pretty impressive on imaging, but they're pretty minimally symptomatic. And if you watch them over time, um, it's non-progressive. Um, and then we see people who have rip-roaring progression over short periods of time. So if a patient comes in asymptomatic, um, I, I, I'm very much of the mindset that we discuss the landscape, we get to know each other, and you know, if the symptoms are minimal or tolerated, I don't think there's any urgency to jump to any treatment. I agree, and I think we've seen from some of the studies that have been conducted that that at least the patients who have enrolled in the studies tend to have more indolent disease that, that doesn't progress very quickly. And I think we can watch and, and focus more on symptoms. The other thing I think that's a challenge for, for us who, who deal mostly with malignancies is that this, this is not a life-threatening disease. This is a benign disorder which causes uh, problems based on its location, but doesn't um, the, the symptoms are more related, the, the consequences more related to symptoms rather than to the size of the mass. So, the, an asymptomatic mass probably can be observed, uh, while a small mass that is symptomatic probably needs treatment of some sort. So I think it's, a, it's just a very different uh, paradigm for these locally destructive uh, tumors that are not at risk for spreading to other parts of the body. Yeah, agreed. So, um, you know, I, I think this slide is, is um, a, a single patient's journey, but can be very representative of the recalcitrant nature of diffuse TGCT. Um, and this is a patient who you see over, you know, seven, eight years here on this timeline, started with uh, getting bounced around uh, and getting to the quote unquote right physician, um, then getting the first surgery, um, and, and followed by multiple other surgeries for recurrence, then to radiation, then to systemic therapy. And you see this sort of uh, experience of, of being the patient, putting you know, the patient as sort of this ping pong ball going back and forth in different areas. Um, and, and sort of our um, maybe immaturity as a field in, in presenting this as a true multidisciplinary disease. And, and as our treatment options have expanded, I think we're getting more sophisticated in trying to prevent the introduction of different therapeutics kind of so late in the game. Um, and, and, and I think symbolically, this is a, a, 
a chart that that reflects this in in a little bit of a different form but i think oftentimes these folks are, are sort of going in this circle between pcps and and general orthopedists and sports medicine docs maybe rheumatology and then you know this is the vast majority of tgct and and then cases out of this little loop become you know the tougher ones the recalcitrant the very diffuse types and they get bounced out to the orthopedic oncologists and I think what's really exciting uh, uh, about where we are in this field is that now it really is a partnership on the outside with the medical oncologist to try and figure out a multidisciplinary uh, a team approach to these kind of tougher, more challenging situations. Totally agree. I think this has been a, a really terrific example of how uh, our disciplines can work together in the management of, of this disease. Um, a lot of it came about because of a discovery um, from Matt Vanderein's lab uh, about 15 years ago now, I guess, of uh, dysregulated expression of CSF1 uh, in these tumors by a subpopulation of cells. Um, so there are uh, about 10% of the mass is made up of neoplastic cells that have this dysregulated CSF1 expression, usually as, as a consequence of a translocation. And it leads to overproduction of CSF1 and stimulation of the CSF1 receptor on on the cell itself, but it also is a honing, homing signal for inflammatory cells, histiocytes and macrophages that make up the bulk of the tumor. And that's why this mass becomes a big inflammatory mass uh, that can, can cause um, um, pain uh, and disruption of the joint uh, or the joint space. Um, so, but this also provided an opportunity for targeted therapies uh, against the CSF1 receptor um, with the understanding that most of these tumors have overproduction of CSF1 itself. Initially, um, there were uh, treatments with imatinib as a drug that we had available that had some activity against the CSF1 receptor, uh, following on a, on a case report from, from our colleague Jean-Yves Blay, uh, showing a dramatic response in a patient with TGCT. Um, and this led to um, a global collection of, of cases uh, that's been reported um, uh, in a retrospective series uh, with a response rate of about 30 percent um, in that patient population, although most patients stopped treatment after about seven months. The, um, this does, did lead to uh, imatinib being recommended in the NCCN guidelines uh, for TGCT. There's also, there also have been studies of nilotinib uh, in patients with locally advanced disease um, and in this study, 92% uh, of patients were free of progression at 12 weeks, uh, and still about three quarters uh, were free at a year. Um, but there was a limited uh, response rate um, with only three patients um, obtaining a partial response. So nilotinib probably has uh, less use in this situation, uh, and it's a little bit difficult in this disease that can be indolent to understand what the impact is uh, if stable disease is the best outcome. A more um, uh, potent and specific CSF1 receptor called pexidartinib was also developed and it showed activity in a phase one study that led to a randomized phase three study against placebo. This was called the Enliven study. Uh, and in this study, patients were randomized to receive either placebo or pexidartinib uh, with about 60 patients in each arm. Uh, and the overall response on pexidartinib using uh, resist uh, was 39% uh, and 0% on placebo. Um, using an alternative method of measuring it, the tumor volume score, um, the response rate was higher. It was 56% on pexidartinib versus 0% on placebo. And, and this reflects really that these are not spherical lesions in the middle of uh, a clearly defined space. Uh, so using a longest um, diameter may not be the best method for research measurements of this disease, um, but trying to integrate the whole volume of the disease uh, using something like the tumor volume score is a, perhaps a more accurate representation of what's, what's changing. With longer follow-up, uh, there were, it was an increase in patients having resist responses uh, that came uh, to about the level that was seen with the, the tumor volume score as well. So uh, based on these uh, results, um, and in addition uh, to the size measurements, there were also improvements in patient-reported outcomes. Um, but based on these results, pexidartinib was approved by the United States FDA 
uh, for use in symptomatic TGCT uh, that's associated with severe morbidity or functional limitations and not amenable to improvement with surgery. Um, so now this is an um, uh, on-label indication for uh, treatment of patients with, uh, who meet those characteristics. Uh, and, and here's some, um, here's a really dramatic example of benefit a uh, patient with quite advanced disease in the hand, uh, as you can see, and then with um, ongoing treatment, there's continued reduction in the size of the mass uh, where the fingers again became functional, um, whereas before the mass was really obstructing their, their, um, their, their, their use. Um, but, but as I mentioned early, earlier, it's not just the size of the the tumor that uh, is important, but also the functioning of the, of, um, the patient. And, and this is one example. This is um, uh, changes in physical function in the pexidartinib treated group. Um, and uh, there's the promise scale on the left and worse stiffness um, uh, uh, numerical rating scale on the right. Uh, and improvements are being shifted towards the left. And you can see in both of these scales um, there's improvement um, in, in promise or in worse stiffness uh, symptoms. Um, just another reflection of the symptomatic improvement that patients saw uh, on the enlivened study when they were treated with pexidartinib compared to placebo. Um, importantly, with any medication that we're using or any surgery that, that um, is being considered, we have, to, we have to also think about the possible risks associated with this. Uh, and one thing that did arise in the enlivened study was the risk of liver toxicity with pexidartinib. Uh, and two distinct types were seen. Uh, one was uh, aminotransferase elevations in the absence of significant alkaline phosphatase or bilirubin elevation. Uh, this was pretty common. Uh, it was dose dependent, uh, generally low grade, uh, and improved with um, uh, dose reduction or temporary cessation of therapy. Um, there also were a few cases of a mixed or cholestatic hepatotoxicity uh, manifested by increased in alkaline phosphatase or bilirubin, uh, and in some cases also with aminotransferase elevations. This was uncommon. It was idiosyncratic, uh, and, uh, but it could be life-threatening. Uh, and this uh, is a very important thing uh, to be monitored, especially during the early stages of dosing, um, but also as patients continue on therapy. So uh, when we're looking at this, this disease that itself is not life-threatening, we have to carefully balance these risks um, and make sure that we're monitoring patients um, very closely uh, so that we can um, mitigate any risk of, of toxicity. Um, so there are um, uh, guidelines for how to manage this and enrollment in a REMS program uh, is required. Um, and there's monitoring of transaminases of bilirubin, of alkaline phosphatase, and GGT before initiation of drug, weekly for the first eight weeks of treatment, every two weeks for the next month, and then every three months thereafter. Uh, and there's more frequent monitoring that's required if there are severe liver adverse events uh, or if patients are being rechallenged with pexidartinib. Uh, dose uh, reductions uh, also can be performed in 200 milligram uh, increments. Uh, and as I mentioned, um, enrollment in a REMS program is, is required for use of this medication. Uh, so Nick, maybe we can pivot to a, a second case. Um, yeah, yeah, a absolutely. Um, so, and, and, and really, um, I, I think this case is, um, this, this gentleman's experience taught me and our team so much about how the interplay um, can work here between systemic and local therapies. So, um, you know, this is, uh, this is a, a gentleman we'll call Brian. Uh, he's got left hip TGCT, 29-year-old um, avid athlete who um, develops pain all of a sudden while running, um, gets bounced around a little bit uh, in terms of PT, finally gets an MRI, and, and we'll see on the next slide here um, that this, uh, this MRI shows uh, quite an impressive uh, TGCT emanating from the left hip. If you look on the axial view on, on your screens right there, you, you see that there's tumor going anterior all the way in through the psoas. Um, there's, uh, there's tumor pushing medially, and then there's tumor coming out posteriorly that's pushing on the sciatic nerve. 
Um, and on the left, the coronal view, you see there's quite a bit of intrapelvic tumor there inside the iliac wing. So very diffuse. Um, and, and if we advance here, you'll see the other part we see, which is very severe uh, arthritic change. I mean, this is an inflammatory arthritis. Um, and you can see people present at this stage, which is a, a, a destroyed hip joint here. Um, so, you know, this was, um, this was a patient who uh, we looked at and, you know, I said, we can do a hip replacement, but I can't get this tumor out um, con uh, convincingly. It's in the front of the hip and the back of the hip, and I can only go one way or the other. We'll risk destabilizing the hip to go from both, and that doesn't address the intrapelvic lesion. Um, so we introduced him to the idea of systemic therapy. Our medical oncologist met with him, and he liked the idea of neoadjuvant uh, uh, treatment, understanding that his hip would eventually need to be replaced, but potentially kind of downstaging the surgery. So. Here's, um, we, we watched him for 12 months, uh, and you can see here, um, the images aren't great. You still see these pits along the arthritic, sur uh, around the articular surface, but especially on this axial view on the right, you see the tumor that's come out anteriorly has really dissolved into a very small tumor burden out the front, that dark uh, uh, ballooning in the front, and in the back, um, there's a little bit of tumor there, residual, but, but this is a, a, a dramatic response over time. Uh, he tolerated it very well, and, and, but continued to have the arthritic pain. And in fact, one of the interesting things we see is the inflammatory component of this tumor oftentimes can distend the joint itself. And so when they have underlying arthritis and you decrease the tumor, this, this gentleman was, uh, I mean, just so in tune and could say, you know, the grinding pain I get when I walk is now actually worse, but that chronic swollen ache that I had is completely gone. Now it's activity related pain. Um, so, so, you know, really changed things. So um, I talked to him about doing his hip replacement. He was ready at this point, 12 months in, the, the arthritic pain was driving it. But I think what was really interesting for us and our team in, in doing this is I had always planned to kind of go for broke when we did go for the surgery. Uh, if I needed front and back as well as going inside the pelvis, I was gonna try and get everything out because surgical oncologists, that's what we do. Um, and, and in talking to, to this gentleman, we'll, we'll call him Brian, um, in talking to him, you know, he said, I've been 12 months on systemic treatment. I have absolutely no side effects. Um, it's addressing the tumor problem. So what do you think about doing the hip replacement and getting the tumor out that's outside the pelvis, but I'd kind of rather you leave inside the pelvis alone. I'll get back on therapy. We'll see how much continued shrinking of the tumor inside the pelvis I get, and we can kind of live to fight another day if we need to go after it. And, and it, was totally antithetical to the way I had in my head driven this treatment pathway. Um, but when we talked about it, it made a ton of sense. And, and that's what we did. Uh, he got his hip replacement uh, and got back on, on Pexidartinib post-op and, and is doing extraordinarily well. Um, so I'd love to hear your thoughts uh, on, on that approach. I know, I think, I mean, I think that's the perfect management, and I, and I, I like the description of the, the grinding sensation that, that, that patients can feel. Um, I've, I've had similar experiences where patients said, my, my, they would say, my PVNS pain is gone, but my arthritis pain is there. Um, and it's, it's, it's really interesting that they can distinguish between the two. Um, it's not really surprising. It's really sort of a different mechanism of, of the discomfort um, and functional limitations that accompany it. But it does, it does reflect that there still, is, there still can be underlying um, problems in the joint that need ongoing management. Um, but if we can control the disease, uh, then it does allow us to, to address some of those other issues, in this case, this, this gentleman's arthritis in his hip, um, and maintain him on drug to control the rest of the disease that's there. I think it's still an open question about how long we need to keep people on drug. Is this uh, indefinite or can we interrupt it? Um, I think there's still a lot of opportunities for, for study in this area to understand 
uh, what happens uh, when we discontinue drug, how quickly does the disease regrow? Um, can we use it intermittently as symptoms present? Um, but certainly in this strategy where it was not a good surgical option up front, um, but the use of medication um, made it uh, much more amenable to surgery. I think this was a brilliant strategy. I do think one of the interesting things when we talk about neoadjuvant therapy is, is unlike many of the sarcomas we deal with, that neoadjuvant therapy is very kind of dogmatic in its, in its time frames. You know, the number of cycles osteosarcoma get before surgery and then the post-op treatment, these are well-vetted, well-established uh, pathways. And I think, you know, this was one of these cases that was just really interesting to follow along because we said we don't know how long we're gonna treat you, but we're gonna see how you're doing at these different intervals. So. I, I do think this sort of multidisciplinary team is, is uh, and, and consistent follow-up is, is um, kind of the new paradigm for us. Um, it, and it looks like uh, maybe you were going to present a case that, that was um, uh, maybe similar in sort of the idea of neoadjuvant or how we're going to use it. And, and so maybe I'll turn it over. Sure, I think, I mean, this is a similar story. A, a, a patient who had a suprapatellar mass that uh, was not easily amenable to surgery uh, would have been uh, with significant functional limitations following surgery, uh, was treated with pexidartinib um, and had um, reduction in size of the tumor. Um, this is after 55 months uh, with minimal clinical symptoms uh, and significant improvement in functional status. And I think the question at this point is, is what to do. As we were just talking about previously, do you just stay on the medicine or do you try to go in and, and clean out the disease? Um, and if you do surgery, um, does it require medication afterwards as well? Uh, and I think these are some of the challenges that, that we're facing right now. I'm, I'm curious about how you, uh, how you would um, advise this patient uh, in this situation. Yeah, I, I, a r really interesting situation where I think, you know, when that, this initial film walks into an orthopedic oncologist's office, I, I mean, traditionally it's kind of revving up for going for the big surgery. And, and you know, now you've taken this down to a manageable uh, size. Surgically, we look at this and say, hey, maybe I can get this out now. But, you know, if the patient is doing well, um, this sort of moves us out of our orthopedic oncology hat and back to orthopedic surgery 101. And orthopedic surgery 101 is really about not treating films um, because we see osteoarthritis that looks horrible in some patients and they walk in and say, I'm doing fine. I got this x-ray for some other reason and they're telling me I need a hip or knee replacement. And you know we really have to temper our own enthusiasm for making a beautiful post-operative film, and and say the patient's not hurting. And so you know this is someone who um, I think the symptoms it, it I would be following uh, it, it, as you did here. And if the patient's not really symptomatic, um, I've really tempered my enthusiasm for going to quote unquote clean it out, um, short of the patient having some side effects that they really need or want a drug holiday for some reason. And, and if that was a goal, um, then, then maybe you could convince us or that you know, we should go get it now um, to get them off drug. But if they're tolerating it, I, I'd keep watching. Yeah, I completely agree. I think, I mean, there are, there are reasons why a patient may wish to stop the drug. Uh, you know, they want to have a family um, and certainly shouldn't be having children if you're on this medicine. And that might be a reason that patients want to interrupt it. Um, or, or there could be other reasons why they, they need a break from the medicine. But, but I agree, I think um, we shouldn't, I like how you put it, don't just treat the film. Uh, let's, let's figure out what, what the patient uh, wants and what, the, what would be best to recommend. Um, so just to conclude a little bit and, and some take home messages, uh, the localized and diffuse type TGCT are, are clinically distinct entities with a much higher risk of recurrence for the diffuse type. A surgery remains the mainstay of treatment but post-operative recurrence uh, is, is common. Uh, medical therapy may be indicated uh, in patients with symptomatic disease that is not amenable to surgery. Uh, and I think as, as we've been discussing, the multidisciplinary management um, is really important in this, in this disease uh, with 
ongoing discussions uh, whether the disease is, is upfront amenable to surgery or not. Uh, I think having a collaborative approach with uh, orthopedic oncology and medical oncology is, is a really um, important strategy for managing this disease. Uh, Nick, it was great to see you and to talk with you. Um, and this concludes our discussion of modern multidisciplinary TGCT treatment and management. I hope you found this activity informative and useful for your practice. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash AEC 860. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Daiichi Sankyo Incorporated. This activity is certified by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated. This activity is developed with our educational partner, PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education.